Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It's another event in the series uh, for Brand Innovators Livecast. Today, we're going to be talking about two of my favorite topics, uh, entertainment and marketing. Um, both, of, both of these areas have been affected significantly based on what's happened recently. And so I'm really, really excited today uh, to have some amazing panelists to actually talk through some of the important elements of, of strategy, how brands have responded, um, and how we're you know, essentially moving forward uh, coming out of this crisis. Uh, before we get started, just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ritesh Shah. I am the VP Northeast for Brand Innovators Labs, which is a division of Brand Innovators. Um, what we essentially do is we help marketers like you uh, connect from across the entire BI community, and we act as your uh, resource, uh, almost like an outsource optimization and efficiency resource for you um, in order to be able to find some interesting and innovative partners for you to solve your marketing needs. Um, so thank you so much again for joining us today. Uh, before we get going and introduce you to the next, uh, or to the, to the first set of speakers, wanted to just give you a little bit of a, an overview of the platform that you have in front of yourself in case you haven't joined us before. Uh, the very first thing I want to direct your attention to is the, the main window, which is where you will see today's uh, conversation. Uh, you'll also notice there is a, a social widget on the side, um, and that is going to display all of our, our social interactions for today. So if you happen to be on Twitter, um, if you're on LinkedIn, we would really appreciate you sharing your thoughts. Uh, follow along today. Please use the live, um, hashtag BI Livecast. Uh, the other thing I wanted to also uh, flag to your attention is that there is a Q&A window. Um, that you can use to submit questions um, as they come up throughout the session today, and we'll get them answered towards the end of the session. The other piece is a live chat feature, which is very cool. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, that are joining us today on this exciting topic. So if you wanted to just talk a little bit about you know, where you are and you know, have some questions and as, as, as these thoughts come up, please feel free to interact uh, on the chat window. Um, and one other uh, thing I wanted to say is that there is a share feature as well. So if you feel like there is a colleague, a friend that might benefit from today's conversation, it's still not too late uh, for, for you to invite them. So that's basically it in terms of an intro. Um, I would like to move forward and announce um, just, just the first set of speakers. So we have uh, joining us today, Brendan Mulvihill from Jukin Media, who's going to be in conversation with Bill McCullough from the National Football League. Um, and again, you know, as various sports leagues are looking at different ways of getting started, um, you know, over the next coming weeks to months, I'm really excited to have this conversation. So I'll turn it over to you guys, Brendan and Bill. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for catching. Very appreciated. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for thanks for having us. Thanks for the brand innovators for uh, inviting Bill and I to be here. Uh, my name is Brendan Mulvihill. I am the head of licensing at Juke Media. I'm joined today by a, a close friend and a former colleague, Bill McCullough. Uh, Bill, how are you, brother? Good. How you doing, Brendan? Hello, everyone. Yeah, a lot of people. Here, it just feels like it's just you and I. So. Um, <laughs> Another Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah, another Zoom meeting, right? Uh, Bill, you've had this. Uh, I think we'll get to you know what's going on right now with COVID, but I'm actually I want I want to take everybody back because your career is something that I find fascinating. Um, you have probably more experience in sports content creation than certainly anybody I know, and, and have, have established this amazing career. And just to give everybody a little bit of background on this, so you were. Early in your career, you were an editor at HBO, working on a lot of HBO sports shows as well as non-sports shows. You had your own production company for about 10 years, creating sports programming for ESPN, HBO, Fox Sports. Um, you went back to HBO as head of creative for HBO Sports, uh, over to GoPro as an executive producer. Uh, and now you've been at NFL uh, for about three years or so as uh, head of creative and now head of content. So um, it's just, it's, it's truly amazing. I, I, you're a true creative, so I want to get some thoughts here um, around sort of creativity right now, but I also want to touch on something I find interesting, which is your business acumen and your business mentality, you know, and all the things that we talk about, we're talking about ROI, you're talking about KPIs, you're talking about profitability. Um, how did you, how did you develop that business acumen in, in as you are, even though you're a true creative, that you, we miss that a lot. And it, it seems to be something that's probably really important today as we're trying to balance the two in, in, the, in the times that we're in. 
Yeah, I, well, look, I mean, it's something that that uh, has certainly developed over the years. Um, you know, uh, early in my career, uh, I actually started in live television at QVC back in the early, early 90s, even before I became an editor. Um, so I was in live television, and, and that was a very unique uh, role for me. Just it really combined business and television. You know, I mean, trying to sell things over television, at that point was relatively new. I mean, we were used to the bamboo steamers and, you know, the Ronco ads. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember those, but that was our real first experience with buying things over television. And so once QVC started to really kind of take off, um, there were really techniques there that, that resonated with uh, consumers and uh, really kind of gave them the, uh, the, the call to action to buy. So it started back then um, just kind of putting those pieces together. Um, you know, for me, it was always about the art of creating something and the art of storytelling. Um, I'm a musician, so that that kind of rhythm to me in storytelling is super important. And as you start to play in the camera world and lenses, and, and as an editor, I got to cut so many different directors and DPs footage that it was really for me uh, like uh, uh, just a, a master's in, in visual arts. And so as I started to get out of the chair and started to direct more, I really took that with me. Um, and for a long time, it was just about making really cool content, you know, and just like, well, let, let's, let's make the best content we can. Um, and it still is about that, but I've realized that <laughs> you can have the best idea in the world and if there's no funding or distribution or business piece of it, then it usually doesn't get made, you know? And so it started for me when I had my own business and I was at Wonderland and I started to understand that, you know, where I was in the business prior to Wonderland was at the, not the end of the line, but the end of the line where things are decided to get made or they're not, you know, and people are, it's already funded, there's distribution. And now, now the goal is to execute and make it. The further back in that process you go in a development standpoint, the more of a plan you have to have in terms of like, well, this is great, but how are we going to make money? And how are we going to monetize it? How are we going to distribute it? And so those were the things that started to really bubble up to me and understanding, okay, well, what is the actual strategy um, that we're trying to achieve? You know, and at GoPro, this was a, a great, um, for me, GoPro was just like a, a, a master's in, in digital media and strategy because Yes, we can make a great piece of content, but it was, what is it for? You know, what is, what is the purpose of it? You know, uh, are we monetizing it? Is it to drive people to behave a certain way? And so I really started to get fascinated with that, uh, that end of it. And, um, you know, now it's all about, uh, you know, for us, especially at, at the NFL, is trying to create content that we can monetize and we can get a return on. Um, it's not just the challenge isn't just making great content. It, it's how do you how do you how do you make content that that is valuable, you know? And I think that is that is a large question because there's so much content out there, and with, with social playing such a huge role in consumption, um, you know, is it about how many likes we get or? Uh, does that translate to value? I mean, and, and value can exist in, in so many different ways. You know, there's the, the revenue piece of it. There's the engagement piece of it. Um, there's the reach. So when you talk about value uh, as it relates to content, there's certainly different targets. Um, but I think those are the conversations now where it's like, okay, let's look at how the, this content strategy maps back to business strategy and how we make money. And those are the best chances. If we can align those things, that's the best chance to get your ideas uh, executed. So it really was almost born out of necessity. Like, okay, <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, it, it's, I'm curious. It, so let's let's go to GoPro for a second because we obviously were there for a couple of years. I think we have some of our, our former GoPro friends uh, coming in. So GoPro is coming off with this wave of just tremendous brand value. Right, and ultimately we have to sell sell cameras. You made this move from a broadcaster at HBO to GoPro, and, and, and ultimately had a, like, we had to move cameras. Right, that's what ultimately was, was, was the deal. What what was your what was your mandate coming in, and how did you? What was the vision and excitement that you had going from a, a broadcaster to to an actual brand? Yeah, great question. Um, 
So, you know, I started, and I'll just back up a little bit to set that up, but I started Wonderland Productions in about 1998, which was, you know, I had an avid in midtown Manhattan, and that was it. And I was able to really grow that into five rooms and two Pro Tools rooms. We had 10,000 square feet in Soho, New York. Um, so it grew, it grew uh, you know, pretty quickly and, and got to be a pretty robust company. Um, then when I left there, I, I went back to HBO as VP of Creative, and I was rebranding. I was doing a lot of that stuff. But through the course of those 10 years and the next five years, I, I saw a shift in terms of when I opened Wonderland, you know, it was much more about well, I had one of the first symphonies in New York City, and I had these great rooms, and people were coming and paying a lot of money for that. And as the years went on, it was less about the rooms and more about really just the creativity. Right. It's like, OK, we don't care if you have an ad, but we just want you to come up and, and be creative up in our space here. So the business model changed. Right. And I started to see some of these big projects for ESPN and NBC that were, you know, one point five, two million dollars, 13 episodes that would last a, a year and employ, you know, 13 people. Those started to change, too, especially around 2008 when the financial crisis hit and those budgets shrunk. And these projects existed, you know, now instead of $1.52 million to do 10 episodes, it was $250,000, $350,000. And I started to get more and more digital clients. And we started to do back in the day, it was called webisodes. So I started to do all these webisodes and just the digital work that I was getting versus the broadcast work has really started to, to shift or even out. And so when I realized that the brick and mortar production at that point, 2008 to about 2010, the model was changing. Um, the margins shrunk. Um, and uh, I decided to leave that brick and mortar behind and join HBO. I was fortunate to be in the middle of a, a, the Lombardi documentary um, when I, they offered me the staff job, and I, I took it. And so even over the course of those five years, I started to see changes at HBO and just changes in television. And we started to get from our executives um, challenges and oddly enough, one of the uh, the videos that I, was sent to me was a GoPro sizzle reel from from Ken Hirschman, and he said to me, "Well, how can we do more of this stuff?" And you know, between us, I was already in talks with GoPro, so I'm like, "Well, uh, let me tell you, I'll tell you in about the three months." So I, I just saw the shift, you know, and it was it was attractive to me. Um, I knew that that's where the industry was going. And to, you know, God bless Will Tidman, one of my great friends who reached out to me on LinkedIn and brought me into GoPro. Um, that for me was like such a huge opportunity because I could see where it could lead. You know, yes, it was known as a camera company, but the content and the vision that they had um, was just so compelling at that time. The world was different back then, too. You know, I mean, I think it was YouTube it was exploding. Um, you know, GoPro had not even done a, a television commercial to 2014. So they had managed to build their entire brand through YouTube, um, which was phenomenal. You know, I mean, Nick Woodman and Todd Ballard, the, the, their vision was amazing. But to me, I just saw that's where it was all going. You know, the opportunity in the digital space, um, less, uh, less strings attached, more freedom, um, more of the Wild West mentality. Yes, the, the monetization wasn't quite there yet, and I still were, all, were always working on that, but it was much more attractive to me. I saw a much greater opportunity in that world um, and, and the ability to really take what GoPro had done and move it to the next level through things like uh, creating series and, and more storytelling that um, techniques from the HBO sports and the documentary world that we can apply to that type of content that would make it a little bit wider uh, of an appeal for an audience. And so that's where I was just like, you know, I think all of us who, who were brought in in 2015 to GoPro saw that as an enormous opportunity uh, for us to really kind of move the needle in that space. And, and that's how it happened. You know, for me, I'm always looking for that next thing. I'm not I'm never quite satisfied. I'm not one to just, I'm not like a house cat to just kind of hunker up for 15 years and, and, do that. I'm always trying to kind of move forward and look at the next thing, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, um, what we're doing in production and, and storytelling. Um, so that's just kind of me by nature. And the opportunity, again, to go to GoPro was a no brainer in my mind. That's awesome. Uh, I want to talk about you touched on something in terms of expanding an audience. And I'd like to just focus on authenticity for a second. Right? At GoPro, mm -hmm. 
we were maniacal about maintaining authenticity um, and, and uh, but also had to balance that with growing an audience. I feel like at the NFL, it's probably very similar, right? In the sense that NFL is so huge that you don't want to lose that core sports NFL guy who just loves the X's and O's. But at the same time, in order to keep growing, you have to develop different programming to reach new audiences, right? And I'm curious, can you, talk, can you talk to us a little bit about like that experience at GoPro, that experience at the NFL? How do you do that? How do you make sure that you're not alienating the core fan, but still trying to grow at the same time? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, at the NFL, we have the unique, I don't know if it's a problem, but, you know, there's 189 million fans worldwide. You know, 70 million of them considered avid fans. And when you look at that, I mean, it really encompasses everybody, you know, uh, old, young, red, blue. I mean, it, it is an enormous fan base. And so when we start to look at um, the consumption patterns and behaviors of, of this audience, that's really where, where the direction comes from. You know, you look at, uh, I, I use this example all the time with, with, with uh, my 15 year old son, especially as it relates to live games. Um, on a Sunday, you know, he'll go, I, I, I'm, I'll sit and I'll watch either Red Zone or I'll watch uh, uh, you know, the full games uh, pretty much all day. And my son will be, I'm not sure where he is, but I know he's not watching the games. He might be on Snapchat, he may be on YouTube, he may be on all these other platforms. But at the end of the day, we can sit there and we can talk about the game, right? It's kind of co-viewing, even though we didn't, we weren't in the same room, we weren't watching the same device or, or the same broadcast, but we're able to have that discussion and he consumed the game in the way he consumes it and I consumed it in the more traditional way. And so I think the point is when we look at the different uh, demographics as it relates to age, the younger fan is consuming the game in many, much different than, than you or I when we were growing up. You know, Sunday comes, we're in front of the television pretty much all day for seven hours. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. And so for us, we need to be present on these platforms in an authentic way that reaches these younger uh, fans, um, as well as, you know, my father who's sitting there in the living room and he will sit there and watch for seven hours. So it, it becomes really interesting um, for us in terms of from a live game standpoint. And, and that's why you'll see, you know, two years ago, we really opened up the cross carry distribution across all uh, mobile. And, you know, we're seeing double digit growth there. Um, the Twitch, uh, you know, because of our Amazon relationship, now we're distributing games on Twitch. Fantastic. You know, and, and what Twitch is doing with the live game experience is super organic to that platform and it's resonating. So I think when it comes to the live game, um, looking at the platforms we're distributing on, taking those opportunities, reaching people where they are, you know, I know it's overused, but fishing where the fish are, um, that's really what we're looking for. When it comes to the shoulder programming and, and the other program outside of the live games, that's also a little bit more um, uh, challenging for us, right? You know, you, our core NFL network and NFL platform fan is, is about the X's and O's, and that's really what they're looking for. They're looking for depth and focus on football, right? We're, we're really the only ones that 24-7, 365 days a year, we can talk about football. Uh, the ESPNs, the NBCs, they have to worry about football and basketball and hockey and all those other sports. But we, we can concentrate just solely on football. And so uh, that also, you know, the, the, the range in storytelling from that core X's and O's game analysis to, hey, let's go with uh, Danny Amendola and, uh, uh, you know, to, to Mexico um, with a helmets off experience. And where, do, right. where does that end up? You know, so it's looking at, and that's where our partners really come in and what we're looking at uh, and social also becomes a, a great kind of vehicle to introduce fans to players without helmets. Right. But it has to be an, an organic uh, experience on that platform. Um, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, no, it, I can it, keep it does. No, no, it does. It makes a lot of sense. You, you're in this unique position with having NFL network as part of NFL media and having to almost compete with yourself in some sense, the NFL, because you have ESPN, uh, you have uh, CBS, you have Fox Sports, and you can find NFL content in a number of different places. 
it sounds mm -hmm. like the differentiation point is you're you're going to that core fan but at the same time like how do you how do you differentiate from from those other other networks and how do you get yeah. eyeballs not only on game day but how do you get eyeballs uh when it's you know middle of the week and there's a there's you know a bunch of other programming programming on, on those yeah networks? well I, I mean look first off we have amazing partners right and cbs and fox and nbc and espn um and, and so the relationship that we have with them needs to be complementary. We need to be supporting, you know, uh, their program. Uh, it doesn't work if uh, Monday Night Football is on and we're putting something on NFL Network and, and we're getting more eyeballs on the network than we are on the games. It just is not the way the relationship is supposed to work. So anything that we do, we really need to be aware that um, there are partners, you know, and yes, there, there is a sense of them being competitors just because we're in the sports uh, storytelling world. But the trick is, how can we be complimentary and not be stealing audience from them, but, but provide that uh, something that they aren't able to provide? And I think it comes down, and we spent a lot of time over the past year talking about differentiators and, and what the NFL media positioning is in the marketplace. You know, and it really comes down to what I had mentioned before about this depth and focus of storytelling as it relates to football. You know, and we are the ones where, you know, e even when it comes to news, I don't know that we necessarily need to break the news as much as we really need to be the authority on, hey, did this really happen? Well, let me check out the NFL to see if this is if it's true. And we see a lot of our fans uh, use our platforms in that matter. They may hear news on Bleacher Report or ESPN or somewhere else. But then they'll come to us and say, hey, is this is this really happening? And if so, then they're going to get the deeper story. You know, um, and, and that is in and of itself, I think, a, a, a huge differentiator in terms of what we can provide in the marketplace and to fans versus what an ESPN or NBC or, or CBS or Fox can provide. Got it. So let, let's take let's think about for a second. We've got uh, the season, you know, on the horizon. We're uncertain. There's a lot of uncertainty, but you, you still have to come up with content, right? And We've talked about how do you provide content on on other platforms. Is there a scenario in which, you know, you're thinking about the inability to go shoot content? How are you focused on still getting content? Is it from players? Is it from teams? Like what's what's happening there to think about content creation in a time where there's there's no shooting? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, as you know, being in the licensing uh, business, Brendan, uh, NFL film vault is just extraordinary. I, I mean, the amount of footage that exists um, is just mind blowing. And so that is always in the back of our minds in terms of creating content um, and how we can best maximize that library um, to, to distribute to fans, you know, and to kind of tell those stories. Um, the, the production, the way it is now with all COVID, um, NFL Films just launched a great series called NFL at Home. And because of their relationships with the players, you know, it, it's a very simple concept, but it's basically Saquon Barkley sitting in his house, you know, on a phone saying, hey, I remember my best run uh, of my career so far or whatever. And he'll tell the story and then we cover it with NFL uh, Films footage and it goes out and it's, it's actually really satisfying. You know, I think that there's that level of, of this type of connection where we're in Saquon's house or whether it's Tyron Matthew or whomever is participating and you get that one on one connection. But then you see this amazing footage and they're talking about moments in their career or they're talking about draft or they're talking about, uh, you know, a bunch of different topics. But it's a great example of how we're marrying uh, the current situation and being able to tell stories with the, the archive footage that that exists. So a yeah. lot of that type of thinking is going on right now. How do you? It, it feels like that that's that is very geared towards core you know fans and, and helping them get closer to their their athletes. And, and one of the things I noticed, I'm curious your thoughts on some of the other leagues. The NBA has done a really great job of making their content available, right, for for fans to use in some capacity. I think the NFL is probably a little you know restricts that usage a little bit more. We've seen the NBA grow. A tremendous amount on on social. Are, are you guys thinking about how do you how do you create a closer connection with the fans using using content and and giving them the opportunity to, to do more with it? and then involving the fans within the program and maybe they, that you're talking about? 
Yeah. So, I mean, when, when you talk about the NBA and, and they've done an amazing job, e even from a social standpoint, you know, um, but there's a couple differences, you know, I mean, you've got guys in shorts with no helmets. Um, there's only, you know, five guys on the, on the floor on the team out there. Football's different. You know, you're in the gear, you've got the helmets on there's, there's 22 guys out there. Um, you're much further away. Um, and, and so that the ability to, to, uh, to put out helmets off content and, and get people to recognize football players, there's a challenge there. It's just an, innate cha uh, an inherent challenge there due to the, the nature of the sport. But what right. we're noticing is this younger demo is really starting to uh, be player first fans. So when you look at, at some of the younger fans, um, back in the day, if it were, um, you know, uh, Ron Jaworski plays for the Eagles, now he's traded to the Cowboys. Well, I'm not. I'm not a Ron Jaworski fan anymore. He's been playing for the Cowboys. I, I I don't like the Cowboys, right? I don't think you see that that much anymore, uh, especially with younger fans. OBJ's on the Giants. He gets traded to the Browns. Hey, I'm still following OBJ on Instagram. I'm still following him on Twitter. I, I'm following these guys around, and you see that a lot when it comes to the younger demo. Um, also, to kind of add to that is fantasy. You know, fantasy has enabled you to be now. It's not just you're a fan of one team, but you have players that you may have never even seen play before. And now you're following their careers throughout the season. And so you automatically get this attachment with these players. Um, and I would say that red zone also contributes to that. You know, I mean, I love red zone because it gives me a chance to see players that I wouldn't necessarily play see in my market. And so all of these things combined, I think it really uh, it starts to uh, paint a picture of how we can reach younger fans, how we can make that connection through other uh, ways in um, rather than just being on the field. You know, and, I, and all the, also these younger players are also growing up with these cameras and, and just in a different mentality. So for them to do a selfie and, and to record something and, and then throw it out there, I mean, they're, they're their own brands. They really are, you know? And so they're also their own distributors. And so, it, you know, I, I think this whole environment and whole marketplace now is uh, really facilitating this shift because it was never really like that with the NFL. The NFL is very team first um, and still is. But now I think there's a little, little more acknowledgement of, of you know, building these stars and making that connection uh, from a helmets off standpoint with the fans. Well, so I was going to ask you, you just started to touch on it. Does the league and the teams, do they get concerned that it becomes a player first league and a, they have their own distribution outlets or do you lean into it and figure out ways to work to then grow with them? How do how, how you think yeah. that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's definitely we're working with the players because a, a lot of the players are out there with their own production companies and their own ambitions to get into content and storytelling and all that. So I think from our point of view, yeah, absolutely. Like that, that's something that we want to facilitate and embrace and, uh, and really, you know, help them flourish. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that that's definitely uh, changed over the years and, and we're much more uh, supportive of, of that type of, uh, of relationship with the players. Oh, that's terrific. Okay. So there's, uh, we actually have, we have a Q and A section, but there, there's a bunch of questions, and I want to make sure we have enough time to, to get to, to get to some of these guys. So um, let me yeah. let me just pull up what I've got here. Um, you know, one question is, what other leagues do you see? What other sports opportunities or sports um, uh, entities do you see doing really authentic content? Uh, who who else you keep an eye on, and who's who's got your interest right now? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I think the whole sports world's got everybody's interest right now. I mean, baseball, it'll be interesting to see what, what they do as it relates to COVID and, and as they're making their way back. Um, I think we've seen UFC um, last weekend come back. Um, you know, in terms of content, the NBA is really, uh, they do a really good job uh, of promoting their athletes, uh, embracing um, uh, the lifestyle end of it. Um, you know, I would say that NBA has a really good lifestyle component to, to their sport. Um, you know, authenticity is, is important. I, I would say sports, business, whatever you're doing today, just because of, of, of the consumer is so savvy. You know, when you look at marketing and content, 
I mean, how do you separate it now? The more it looks like marketing, the less it works. You know, it's really the most effective marketing is in the form of content today. So I think authenticity is something that not is is just not. Um, it, it's it's ubiquitous now. It has to be because I think that uh, you know, uh, without it, you really the approach isn't as effective as it could be. That makes sense. Okay, so there's a there's a few questions here as I as I look about your interaction with the teams. So content creation with the teams and sort of the separation between NFL content creation, team content creation, and how do you coordinate that communication? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a great question. Um, you know, it, it's 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 a challenge just because um, you know the the clubs are, are, are run like their own businesses. You know, and, and so you have different uh, uh, capabilities with different teams. You have different priorities with different teams. And, you know, from a league standpoint, what we're trying to do is facilitate uh, as much as we can for them to monetize, for them to reach their fans. And, you know, I think that we provide more of a national platform for them. Um, they're very kind of geographic and, and, and regional. Uh, um, and, and when we use our platforms, I think we're getting more of that national kind of exposure and distribution. So it's an ongoing uh, um, kind of dialogue, uh, especially as as just production evolves, you know, almost weekly. Um, it, it's how do we best utilize the clubs and the league together to maximize eyeballs, knowing that really, you know, look, a lot of I think it's 50 percent of our fans are, are team first fans, you know, so, you know, the fans in Philadelphia, unless they're playing the Cowboys, I'm not sure they're so interested in hearing stuff about the Cowboys, you know? So that is a very uh, delicate balance that, that we have to deal with uh, when it comes to the league platforms and the network. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's getting better all the time, being able to work with the clubs as their capabilities grow and we understand more how to utilize their content. Um, I think that that is only going to go grow stronger and stronger, and it, it's a huge initiative uh, inside the league now is to work, you know, in, in a very cohesive way with the clubs. Well, we see that on social, right? We see big fan followings across social for, for specific teams, and I think that that makes sense. Like at, at the heart, uh, and you're from Philly, you're a, you're an Eagles fan. I'm a Steelers fan, and those are the those are the sort of the, the teams that we follow, right? And that's what we want right. to see. So. That's right. Um, and, and, and when it comes to marketing, you know, and we're, when we're marketing something like Game Pass, you know, rather than feed you highlights of a random team, it, it's all about personalization and customization, you know. So we're going to feed Rams fans Rams content, you know, when, when we're looking at Game Pass. And it's, that, it's, it's feeding those fans the content that resonates with them. And I think that we've seen tremendous uh, um, improvement in, in making that connection over the past couple of years. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, lots of brand marketers on on this call, and so what thought advice can you give them on on working with the NFL and sort of the, the idea of, you know, what does a true partnership look like versus just a, a sponsorship? Hmm. Uh, great question. Um, you know, there's so many levels to that. Um, I don't know that I'm the most qualified to answer that question. We have a whole sponsorship team, um, you know, so I, it, it's tough. I mean, a lot of people want to work with the NFL. Um, we, we work with a lot of partners, a lot of sponsors. The relationships are, are uh, different. Each one is different. Um, you know, I, I, and I'm probably not the most qualified to speak on that. Uh, to keep it to the creative and production and, and, that part, and, uh, and I think I'm more well suited to speak to that. That makes sense. Um, when you, uh, we've got a, a, a really good question. I think here, in terms of um, when we're talking about authenticity, and you, you're sort of maybe struggling to figure out how do you make a piece authentic to each platform? How do you overcome that? Like, what are the what are the things that you do to learn more about a specific platform when you want to put content on it so that it resonates with that audience? You know, Instagram is different than TikTok. It's different than Facebook. It's different than the network. How do you learn about those those platforms so that you're producing the right content for that platform? Yeah. So I would say it's all data, right? It's all based on that data. Um, we have great relationships with all the platforms. We have an amazing team that works pretty much daily with each platform to understand what their audience is, what what best practices work on those platforms, and um, you know. 
it, it, it's for us, it's about looking at, rather than looking at the particular platform and, and developing for the platform, we develop around content and we look at these platforms as distribution points, right? So there is the content that lives in the center and then how do we get that out there? And, and that is the most important thing. And it's really based on an audience first approach. You know, we may find that for some content that this platform, does, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. So we won't create content in this particular uh, uh, bucket for that, for that platform. Um, but it comes down to understanding the audience, you know, and getting that data and understanding the behaviors and consumption patterns in that audience. And then how does that content fit on that platform? And is that the audience you're going after? You know, so it, it's a real, we, we start with the audience first. So it really has to start with the audience. And then the best practices are, you know, per platform. I, I think we're all getting used to what those best practices are now. It's not rocket science, but, uh, you know, I think that is, it's just an audience first approach. So if we, and this is a bit of a self-serving question. Um, so we've talked about this before in terms of involving the fans in that, that content experience. And, and the yeah. idea of fan, fan content, because there's so much being created, right? They're at the bars, they're at home, they're at the games, we're recording it, we're putting it out into the world. How, how are you thinking about that? Is that something that's top of mind in terms of how you integrate fan content and fan experience within the content that you're creating? Yeah, absolutely. And I think on the club level, that's that's a lot more, um, they're focused on that and they can tell those stories a little better. Um, two years ago, we did a, a series for Thursday Night Football called TNF Presents. And the idea was to put out content on a Thursday that would kind of act as, you know, a little trailer for the game, but it didn't really have any football in it. It was more about uh, connecting the club, the city, and the fans. And so we identified um, interesting fan aspects for each of these. You know, if the game was on a Thursday night in Cincinnati, and we did a, a really cool piece on, on this guy, JB, um, who was, uh, he used to just hang outside the locker room when Paul Brown was there. Paul Brown took a liking to him, brought him under his wing, and 45 years later, he's still running the team out onto the field. The guy's like 75 years old. So it was a, it was a great way to tell the story about fandom, um, to kind of give the city and the team a place of, of location and just make that connection between all three. And, and we did that uh, for 10 games throughout the, the 2018 season, and it, it was fantastic. It really, the engagement was there. We got tons of earned media just from locally. Uh, the, the local news picked it up, and they loved the stories. So it was a, it was a great way to utilize uh, those fan stories um, on a national level to point at specific games. But clubs kind of do a better job of, of tapping into their fan base. Yeah, it's, it's it'll be interesting to uh, see, you know, as we, and just talking about more involving the fans, as, as we move towards the season and we think about, you know, how things change, you think there, and this is a question that was asked, you think virtual watch parties uh, are something that, that we start to think about? How do you put fans together and to watch their, their teams maybe on Twitch or Amazon or something like that? Does that feel like... Uh, thing no i mean look i i i love that idea and that because you know the thing to me is about watching the game with your friends it's, it's the energy it's it's the being able to react to to what's happening on the field and if there are no fans in the stadium that becomes really difficult but i think we're getting more and more conditioned to this type of environment and so you know if if we are playing with no fans in stadiums uh, then watch parties to me seems really logical you know and it seems like something that as a fan i would be interested in if i can get an eagles watch party especially uh you know for for fans that may be out of market or whatever but i i think that's that's part of the uh the camaraderie and the excitement uh that that football brings is being able to have that group dynamic and that that excitement together and celebrate together. I mean, you, you go to a foot, you know, you go to a, you go to an airport, you, you could have a conversation for a half hour with somebody, not even know them just based on the Eagles or, you know, and, and that's what football does. It brings you together. And I think that's part of the magic that I don't know that digital fans or even fake crowd noise can, can replace. Um, but that's the bond and the connection that exists in, in the NFL fan universe. Yeah, I can't wait for it, man. I'm super excited. I hope that we can get back to normal and that we can have those conversations and we can argue who's better, the Steelers or the... the, the, the right. uh, yeah. uh, 
All right. Well, listen, Bill, it, I could talk to you all day, man. Uh, and there's a lot more of your career and a lot more of the, to, to discuss. So hopefully we can do this another time. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, everybody, thank you for, for all the questions. And uh, we'll bring back in uh, Rakesh to take us to the next, uh, next segment. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, man. Rakesh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for a great conversation, Brendan. Thank you very much, Bill. That was awesome. Some great insights. I always love hearing from sort of the inner workings of there's so much thought that goes behind all of this stuff. So thank you so much.